I met Pasha Roberts out in the hallway because I bought this book because Scott had given me one and autographed it. But I wanted to show people the book around, so Shirley left the, the one with the autograph up in the room so it has some value in the future. So I paid a 10 bucks and I said to the guy, hey, I don't know who you are, but can you uh, take, the, take the money here? He says, of course I can take the money. I'm living right next door here. I don't work for him. This is my place here. And I looked up because when I read the schedule, I said, Pasha Roberts, that's like Shaquille O'Neal, man. I didn't know that. I'm reading, I'm saying, I don't know who that is. Pasha, that's not something that, mm. Shaquille, what do you mean Shaquille? Big gorilla dude, seven foot tall named Shaquille. Help me out. But I couldn't get on people's name. I got a name Body at the end. All right. But anyway, Pasha said, I'll take the 10 bucks and I'll give it to Scott Beeser. And oh, by the way, I know who you are. So he says, you're the guy in the book. <laughs> no, I'm the guy, no. <laughs> he says, I'm up speaking after Scott. And I have a movie production group here. And we do movies and we do make animations out of real movies and stuff. And he showed some, and they had a black guy there. I said, okay, they're pretty good. <laughs> hey, that's all right, you know what I mean? Because, you know, we use that as a standard sometimes to see if they're real or not. I went to college at Bucknell University from 1957 through 1961, and there were a total of the school had about 2,500 students. There were a total of three black students in the entire school the, four, the whole four years I was there. I tell you, so it's easy being in a group like this, you know? <laughs> I'm used to it. People used to ask me, so how can you hang out with all those white people? I said, it's easy. I've been trained to do that. <laughs> I was the first black kid in Rochester, New York's history to ever become an Eagle Scout. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do it. I just said, what do you got to do? They said, do this tenderfoot, second class, first class, star, life, Eagle, get 21 badges, blah, 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 blah. I said, okay, what the hell? I'll do it. And I asked my scoutmaster, who was white, I said, Custer, tell me something. Is there any of that race stuff in here? He said, no. If you do it, you'll make it. Because you got to check when you're 14 or 13 years old. You've gotten zapped a few times. So you say, hey, is this legit or not? He said, it's legit. If you can do it, you do it. And I looked up years later. I said, there's never been a black kid ever been an Eagle Scout in the history of Rochester, New York, prior to April 1954, when yours truly did that. So. A lot of people said, you're a Boy Scout, well, damn, that's terrible. Well, get out of my face. Hey, you want to fight over it or what? You know what I'm saying? Hey, Pasha, are you ready to come up here and, and wow us? Ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, Mr. Pasha Roberts, the film producer, independent, the man who makes these kind of things. Hey, thank you. I'll, I'll, here you I'll put it on you here. I don't know how I clipped it on myself here. On your belt somewhere? And you can do that on Must yourself? have just been automatic. <laughs> He, he clip signs for other people. He got a PhD in clip on. <laughs> what am I telling you? All right. Okay. Well, uh, thanks everybody for coming. It's uh, it's, it's fun to be here, and uh, I realized when I put the title together, when I say economic disaster in a cool film, I don't actually mean the film will be a disaster. So strike that thought completely. Um, we're actually. Um, or it's about a movie about an economic disaster in the future. So uh, um, basically, I'm going to go through a bunch of different things. Where uh, we just finished wrapping a couple of weeks ago, uh, so that's a picture of uh, Moon from one of our sets. Um, the actors had a lot of fun while we did it. But uh, I'm going to talk about why we're doing a film and some of the details about it, and try to leave some time for questions. Um, but basically, first off, why in the world am I doing a film and not you know, working at Reason and writing white papers or carefully explaining my thoughts in a methodical way? Well, we are actually organizing our thoughts and putting it out, but it's in a cultural way. I mean, we're, there's plenty of, um, of documentaries and white papers out there, but they don't really get outside of the confines of the libertarian world. And what we're trying to do is to get way out there and get out into people who haven't heard of this stuff before, or they may be libertarian and not is what we are working on. And, and there's a, a funny balance in that, to try to get a message into the movie and not be blowhard about it, not make it seem like a, you know, we're not quoting tracks from the Federalist Papers inside of the movie and stuff like that. Um, it's, we're actually you know, making it part of people's real lives. So that's what we're doing. Um, and, you know, when this is the screen's really dark, but 
it, it's okay, I guess, because we have black characters, so I guess it's, you know, it goes up black. So, um, but basically, you know, your friends aren't going to read your Murray Rothbard book. You know, I love Murray Rothbard. He's funny. He's witty. Um, you're never going to get your friends to read his book. Um, you might be able to get them to watch a movie like ours that covers a lot of these ideas, but in a fun, interesting way. The left does this all the time. Uh, the libertarian folk have done this in different variants in different ways. Um, I have some up here, a couple of the people that, um, like Lady Magdalene and Star Trek Gods of Men are here, which is nice. Um, and some of them are debatable, like is Avatar a libertarian film or is it a leftist environmental film? It depends on what glasses you're kind of wearing when you're watching it. I, I like to think of Avatar as a, as a, well, 3D glasses, I guess, but, you know, um, but it's an interesting way to tell a conservative from a libertarian when you see um, Avatar and what impression you walk away with. Um, and there, I have some documentaries down there too, but there's so many documentaries and they only speak to the choir. So, um, um, and part of what I realized, in, I have a degree in economics, a degree in finance, I studied the Soviet Union and been to the Soviet Union back when it was Soviet. So I, I have a real interest in what it's like for people um, under these totalitarian, under these survival situations, under hyperinflation. And that's kind of what's driving this, is what kind of story can we tell about life in that world, just to kind of warn people about where we're heading and where the economics of what we're doing is leading us. So I have a bunch of questions in there, um, but what it led me to believe is, and to understand, is that the libertarian mindset has some really cool story elements. Just as a storyteller, you know, we have disaster, we have collapse, we have fighting, we have fighting the man. I mean, all the elements of every major story is right in there. So let's pull on those and have some fun with that. Um, so I'm going to play a teaser now, which um, I didn't tell how to do. So, oops, oops. I'm going to go back one. That's my secret reveal slide. Um, yeah, and just hit Apple F, please. So there's supposed to be sound on this. It's coming pretty dark. Okay, um, and then the slideshow thing in the lower left there. Yep. Um, that's too dark to really see, but we're playing it out there in our booth all day, so feel free to check it out. The gist of the story is really that um, we have rebels fighting the Federal Reserve in 2019. Um, I can answer questions about our scenario in more detail, but basically it's a rebels fighting the man kind of story. And we make, everybody says, oh, the Fed's so bad already. Just wait till you've seen them in the movie, because they are really bad in this one. I mean, we have really amped up their level of things. For example, we have a um, uh, strategic housing reserve and a Department of Housing Stability, where the Fed buys up entire neighborhoods, empties them out by force, and um, basically uses that to expand and contract to control the housing supply, so we never again have a housing collapse. You know, uh, it's kind of like paying farmers to not farm. It's not that far-fetched. Uh, but we're, we're, and we didn't even delve into the really wonky um, high level inflation things like hyperinflation. Uh, hyperinflation is really hard for normal people to understand. So we just made prices 10 times what they are, which is easily plausible and by 2019. Um, and that's pretty severe as it is. Um, I can get into the wonky economic things, the reverse Gresham's law for anybody who wants to, to play that. I'm happy to talk about it, but basically the idea is that the rebels, in addition to the explosions and car chases and all the fun stuff that the rebels do, um, their main act of rebellion against the Federal Reserve is to make their own money. Um, they, they make their money out of rounds of silver. We actually made our own rounds of silver, which match the coins um, and actually match my tattoo. Um, that, um, you know, it's illegal to make these coins under the Coin Act of 2016. Um, but they do it anyway, and the, and the people love it, and that's a big part of their support in the movie. Um, and it's a whole story about our alternative currency and competing currencies, um, and 
we're just starting to realize that the silver community loves this. Um, so this is actually a really uh, fun place to be. Uh, so we're talking to a lot of them. I'm going to flip through a bunch of pictures here, but we do, um, we have our own little um, green screen studio. Um, we made our, these little head cameras that attach the actors' heads. There's like a boom with a camera on it so that you can see their face. We have perfect capture of their voice and their facial movement. Um, and it's great for the actors because every set is make-believe. Every um, actors are used to making something out of nothing. In this case, they have really next to nothing. This is a, which one is this? This is the inside of a, well, I won't, just, I won't give away the plot, but there's a horrible place inside the, in a basement somewhere where all this action really happens. Um, and for actors, it's really easy for them to imagine it. And the theater actors we have in Boston are even more into it. Um, they're not, there's no camera in your face. They're just acting in the round. And so they had a lot of fun with it. Um, you know, um, and there's just very little in the way of um, what we're doing. It's just pure acting. We're capturing um, what their motion and their faces and their voices do. For the cars, we actually, um, can we go back one to the car one? We actually, cars from an animation point of view are very difficult because it's a confined space and you don't want somebody's arm going through a door or things like that. And so we actually went to a junkyard and got car seats and put them on risers and we got a steering wheel. So now let's go forward um, and uh, put the steering wheel on a base. And so they, they're actually driving and we separate the car seats based on the different models. Like we have a smart car and we have a Crown Vic and all that kind of thing. So um, they're acting out and riding around like they would be in a real car. And then we do the fans, add them into the car in animation and do all the fancy driving and CG. Um, and really everything else is post-production, is done in post. Everything in animation is almost post. So it's really pure performance capture. Um, one of the interesting things is that the cameras are in post-production. So we recreate the scene in 3D and then we can put a camera right on somebody's face or a wide camera or a helicopter shot or whatever I want as director. Um, you know, I could put, a camera inside the bottle and go through the bottle into his mouth and down into his stomach if I wanted to. Um, you know, there's no physical constraint. So um, all the cinematography, although it exists in my head, but the real camera cinematography is going to happen after the initial animation is done. We're talking mainly to three groups. Uh, the Liberty people, who I think are starting to be fairly well known at, we go to a lot of Liberty conferences and I've done a lot of radio shows and that kind of thing. Um, we're talking to the comics world. Uh, we just got back from the New York Comic Con, which had something north of 80,000 fans there, rumored up to 100,000 fans. I mean, it's just the line of people we had for our screaming contest was probably, you know, we had more people in our screaming contest than were at this whole conference. Uh, twice as many, actually. So it, it's, you know, um, it's a really huge, young, media-consuming, open audience, and it's really exciting to be involved with them. And as animation, we get to do that. And the silver world, we're just getting involved with, but we made our own silver pieces, as you can see. And they're, I'm finding they're really, really into this because we're kind of validating their worst dreams. You know, they're saving up the silver for the dollar collapsing. We show the dollar collapsing, and. Um, yeah, and the silver coming to the rescue. So, um, so that's an older audience, but it's uh, really interesting. Uh, I think I talked about the Comic Con. Um, one of the things we do at the Comic Cons is we have screaming contests. And um, boy, I wish these pictures looked better. You can look at them better in our booth. But the, um, there's a couple of scenes where we have um, explosions and we want to get screams from, the, from people. And we have plenty of actors, but what we do instead is we actually are getting screams from the audiences, from the fans, from the floor, and putting it directly into the soundtrack of the movie. So it's this way to get audience involvement directly and immediately. And they're loving that. We had, at, like, last weekend, we had over 500 people scream, which earplugs. needed earplugs, lots of earplugs. Uh, yeah. Um, we're, we've also started to release our, our comic online. Um, we have an initial comic called The Chase that's up there, but the, um, the real uh, comic actually is starting to come out as of last week. And every Tuesday and Thursday, we'll be releasing a new page of that 
through completion. It's kind of a race, whether the movie's done first or the comic's done first. But it's the same story, but it's redrawn. Um, you know, the movie's in 3D, um, and then this is drawn in 2D. So you got a different artist's point of view of the whole thing. Um, and we're hoping possibly to take the book and put it into the DVD. So when we sell a DVD, there's actually something physical, something that somebody wants um, to have and won't just copy. Um, as an animation studio, we're really lean, mean. Um, you know, our, our production budget is 1.6. Um, we, and we have it, um, probably all the capture is done. And so now we're really um, talking to folks um, at, for donors as finishing funds. And um, we did obtain 501c3 status via fiscal sponsor, American Film Renaissance. So I'd love to talk to anybody in that regard. But the, uh, the main thing is that um, we're well on our way and we're tenacious. We, we get these things done. And part of what's interesting to us is to get this done in time for the presidential debates starting next year. Because um, if it's anything like 2007, and I think it'll be even more intense, um, it's going to be a really interesting and exhausting debate kind of year, um, largely about economics, largely about debt, um, possibly even about the Federal Reserve. So, It'll be fun, actually, to inject this into the whole debate season. And it almost rather release, if it was done now, it, I, I would be thinking about releasing it next year instead of now. But it's not done now, so we're racing to get it done. Um, we're aiming to do a limited theater kind of release and then um, all the secondary things. But it's distributions and changes um, you know, quarter to quarter, video on demand and online, all that stuff is, um, I'm thrilled to talk to any other filmmakers about the issues of uh, filmmaking and uh, distribution, because that's a really tricky, interesting subject. Um, right now, our main levers is to focus on building our biggest, as big of a fan base as we can, uh, and to focus on making as great a movie as we can. Um, one thing that is either a gimmick or a tactical advantage is 3D. I mean, the movie is already in 3D, so it's kind of a matter of output um, to get the convergence right and put it onto stereo. Uh, and we've, we've done this. We have the pipeline to do this. So there is a, a factor where some little theaters are actually starving for 3D content um, because they can get the better ticket prices at it. So there may be a, an advantage to us to releasing it that way. And we're just continuing to evaluate whether there's a deal in there, or whether it's worth it. Basically, you have to render a second eye and put them together. But it's not a whole lot more work than that for us. Um, we're very active online. Uh, we have a pretty large Facebook group, thank, thanks to Megan. Um, our website, we have two blogs. One blog is all political stuff, we ha um, and the other one is all artistic stuff. So I think we now we have something going on every day. We have Movie Monday, the Comic on Tuesday, Rebel the Week on Wednesday, another Comic on Thursday, and then Fed Friday. So there's always, put, always putting out little articles and stuff that's going on. Um, so join us there. We have all the information up at the booth. Um, as far as donations, as I said, we, you know, we are tax exempt and we're looking for um, ways to involve people at that level as well. Um, and uh, you know, the, the main thing that this will does is it brings liberty into a wide group of young adults. And really, this, this beginning, this is kind of an interesting experiment for us as far as making a film in this genre. It's kind of like what happened with faith-based films. Um, a number of years ago where there wasn't really a proven market for this kind of thing. Um, and then uh, once the passion came along and all that kind of thing and what was the fire, I don't even follow the genre, so it's fireproof. Um, you know, it kind of proved that there was a real genre for that kind of thing. And now there's a bunch of films being made in that area. Um, not just sort of stealth ones, but actually overt faith-based films. And we're, I'm really curious whether there's, this is actually also true for Liberty. And if, there, if there's a large audience that's just been starved by Hollywood, and we don't have to use Hollywood to do this, I can do it. Our, you know, filmmakers like us can do it. So um, looking for other stories, looking for, I mean, looking especially at a lot of comics and a lot of graphic novels to find stories there. Um, and obviously, we've left this open for a sequel. But, um, those are some initial thoughts. Um, you know, I'll leave it open to questions and thoughts from the audience because I, I just wanted to touch on things and uh, let you uh, um, follow up on areas that were interesting to you. Is that going to replica the same That one, that's a gold um, walking liberty there. 
Uh, well, that one is dated 2006. So you can still buy them. Yeah, yeah, that, that's been an enduring design. I mean, the, the Walking Liberty is, um, you know, it has been very commonly done and commonly replicated in sort of low ways. You can get them in silver, too. Um, so, um, but yeah, I decided to put some gold on there, too, just give it a little fair shake. Um, it, it evolved. I mean, we originally started, I started pretty much right after Lehman went down at the end of 2008 and said, you know, there's a, because we've been making animation about economics and finance for years, and uh, we'll be showing some of our Save Sunny stuff, is it tonight or tomorrow night? Um, but we realized this is like the mother of all economic stories. This is going to be really cool, so let's make a movie about the crash. And we started looking at the timeline and said, you know, by the time we're done with this, in like 2010 or 11, uh, even moving really fast, nobody's going to care about what a CDO is or a CDS or swaps or, you know. So we decided to push it forward into the future and make everything worse. And then, so that's what kind of led to the dystopian approach. And then, our initial readers, when we, you know, we our first draft of the script came out, the readers read it and they said, you know, why, why are the rebels blowing up stuff and everything? I'd, the world's not bad enough. And so we actually now have made it even worse. So um, it's still not that far-fetched, I don't think. But it's, it's, that it, it, as a purveyor of dystopia, that's, that's kind of what we had to go through. So any other thoughts about production or? What's the response been so far? It's been very positive. I mean, it, it, We've gotten really good, um, you know, feedback inside of the Liberty world. Um, you know, a lot of people at least just, you know, said, "I really look forward to seeing this." There's nothing like it. Um, in the comic world, um, people say, "Oh, that looks really cool." I'm looking forward to um, to getting on it. Um, obviously, people love to scream inside of that. Um, the, I'm getting good feedback on the, the race side of it too, even though that was sort of we have no racial message really whatsoever. Um, we just found that this Jay, who's the investigator, was the best looking guy at that time. And at the show, like last weekend, I'm, all, I, I'm getting a, a lot of great, f the comics community is very, very diverse. I mean, the, there's much more diverse than any of these rooms. I mean, it's um, everywhere we go. And um, so a lot of people are appreciating the movie just because we have a black lead that we don't kill. And, you know, and he, um, you know, and he, you know, it gets to sort of um, have a mixed race relationship. It's just kind of um, shocking that's even a special thing, but. So he's actually alive at the end of the He's alive at the end of the movie. Well, it, to me, this is sort of incidental. I mean, it's sort of, I, you know, I just don't really, I'm judging by the content of his character, and, <laughs> and he just was better looking than all the other people. You'll get major points for Stephen Barnes for that. Okay. Well, the other test that really shocked me is the, um, what was the name of that? There's a, there's a comic strip that has a thing about, um, uh, it's called um, Dykes to Watch Out For, but there's a, it's for about women in film. Bechtel, the, Bechtel. the Bechtel test. And then that test basically, a, to be acceptable to this film strip, or to this comic strip, a, a film has to satisfy four things. There has to be more than two named female characters. They have to talk to each other. Uh, and they have to talk to each other not about men. And they have to have names. Pretty simple things. A shocking number of films don't even fulfill that. I mean, our first draft actually didn't fulfill that. And I mean, now it does very well. But um, just two female characters that have names that talk to each other. Um, it, so um, we totally cover that now. Um, and uh, one of our favorite characters, actually, aside from Zoe, is, is Bernie, the pot-smoking lesbian. Because pot is legal in 2019. So. Um, so that's some of the response, and the silver people really are eating it up today, just because we're fulfilling their fantasies. <laughs> Have you gotten any negative response? Um, I get some people, most like libertarian conferences, that say, why are um, these anarchists? Which I think they mean is, why are they violent and blowing things up? Um, and um, the main answer to that is that because it's a movie, and um, it, real politics is pretty boring. Um, so. Um, if you're actually going to show a struggle, you actually have to per personalize it and you know amplify it. So 
that's partially the reason to make the world worse, is just kind of, kind of justify that. That's the main one I've heard. I haven't heard any other, uh, any other. Oh, the Federal Reserve doesn't like us. No, I, I got kicked out of the Boston Economic Club based on this, and, um, and uh, they've been tracking us now. I'm thinking of whether to block them or not off of our website, um, just to do counter surveillance. Yeah, I mean, I've been, there's a, it's basically this um, lunch club of economists that I was a member of, um, and then um, they found out about the film, um, partially because we provoked them a little bit, but, um, and, they, uh, and they kicked me out, so. Um, but the meetings are actually at the Boston Fed, so I was going into the Boston Federal Reserve um, <laughs> twice a month, <laughs> so, yeah. Is anybody sniffing around? No, no. I mean, we're using a fiscal sponsor, so it, it's which means that it's a a different organization than us. That um, their mandate is to promote film, and so they um, so film is film. They do all kinds of different films. Actually, they they mainly focus on libertarian and free market and conservative films. Um, but um, no, I mean the interesting challenge would be something like if Ron Paul runs for. President, and then we have, we're thinking of having a billboard on our, one of the streets that says free Ron Paul. Is that gonna contradict some sort of campaign um, issue or not? But that's, that's gonna be pretty minor. Um, so no, I haven't had any. Uh, well, as if he's in prison. So. Uh, yeah, so we're gonna put him in jail. <laughs> so, so, yeah. No, they've read, the, they've, they've read the script, they know what it's about. I mean, um, some of them are very supportive. Um, some of them vent, um, like Greg. I mean, he would just vent on me every, you know, um, thing he heard on his right-wing talk show, um, and, you know, and grand appreciation. And other ones, they just haven't said a lot. I mean, they say, well, you know, they like to watch NPR or something, but they um, did a grand job acting, and uh, that's what acting is, you know. It's, um, we, we don't, I don't have a litmus test for the actors, except for that they're a really, really good actor. Um, so, and we actually managed to get away with finding the talent we needed um, outside of SAG, too, which is great to be away from the whole um, union thing in terms of the writers or the actors. So, yeah. We, we could, I mean, we've thought about it and it sort of seems expensive, but um, it would be fun to have a game where you get to bonk around and try to blow up the Fed, um, um, which is, I won't give away our ending, but the, um, but yeah, but that would be a, a fun game, but I, I, it feels like a diversion right now. We are gonna, um, we, you know, we are gonna sort of leave that open and you could use these 3D characters easily inside of a thing like that, but. Programming the gameplay and making it interesting and fun, I would have to license that out. I mean, I'm, I've been, I've owned this animation studio and we've been doing it for a long time, so I, I, I'm very comfortable doing this, but I don't know much about doing games, so. Lot, yep, where are we? Where are we on time? Yeah, we're pretty well shut on this one, but keep going. Okay, yeah, the one, only one other thing is that we have an event tonight at 7.30 uh, with Ladies of Liberty Alliance, since, um, basically meet the women of liberty of the Liberty Movement, and uh, it's just that we've had some really nice interactions with them, with Lola, uh, and we have a very strong female lead character, Zoe, who we love, um, and so um, we're starting to do some sort of cross-promotion between Zoe and Lola, and there's a great event at 7.30 tonight, 